live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Inside Scoop, I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me tonight is Kelly Hebron, Esquire, who has founded a very interesting program called From Prisons to Paralegal. Thank you so much for being here, Kelly. Thank you for having us. Having us. So we've known each other for a number of years. Yes. We've talked about many things, many subjects over the years. Yes, but one of the things that both of us have been interested in, and I think the country is interested in, is what do we do not only about criminal justice reform and mass incarceration, but what do we do to help people re-enter our communities? And I think the genesis of this program is about that, but kind of explain to us the thought process that you went through before you landed on this. Um, well, it wasn't something I just kind of woke up one morning and said, hey, let's <laughs> do it from prison to paralegal. It was kind of an evolution. Um, the thought kind of evolved from how do you get people who are usually the last picked for a job, but yet can meet that need, has the skill set, uh, but for one reason or another, maybe because they're, they have a, a background, criminal background, or something that is some type of barrier, how do we get that demographic to employment? And it became an evolution. I know that, um, I, I teach paralegal studies, and I know that as an attorney, most times paralegal profession is not popular. It's not glamorous, it's not on the top of the list of careers. And so people overlook it. But it's a very stable career. It offers a very livable wage, and it offers stability and growth, and it's a professional environment. Right, because it's not just about getting people any job. It has to be a livable wage, and, this, is, and this has a career yes, path. It does, it definitely has a career path, has a lot of opportunities. So just like practicing law where you can do almost anything with a law degree, you really can do almost anything with experience as a paralegal. They can do anything, as, once you're a paralegal, you can do anything, um, let's go back. A paralegal is to a lawyer the way a nurse is to a doctor. Ah, that's a good analogy. And so a paralegal can assist a solo practitioner, it can manage a project, it can go to a large law, large law firm, and then they have non-traditional fields. Executive assistance is a very popular field for paralegals. They have the critical thinking, the analysis, the writing that is required. So those skill sets alone are very valuable, and they're transferable. Paralegal also allows you for entre entrepreneurial um, opportunities. You can start your own virtual paralegal service. And so there's a lot of opportunities as a very competent paralegal for, for a person. You know, to, and I would not have ever thought about a virtual paralegal, even though you, there's all kinds of virtual assistants that have been absolutely. popular for 10 absolutely. years. Absolutely. But absolutely. a virtual paralegal is amazing. Plus, there's mm -hmm. all different kinds of law, too. Yes, One of the is. ones that leaps to mind is real estate. Yes. Right? And yes. so, so many things that can be, documents can be pulled mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. by paralegals. Correct. And reviewed by an attorney. So it makes absolutely. sense that you want well-qualified, highly educated and experienced paralegals. Is that a... a an industry right now that has a lot of job openings? It has extreme amount of job openings. In fact, the title, uh, Virginia Title Association actually has a shortage. Um, not only are a lot of owners looking to retire, right. they have no one to take over. They have no one really in a pipeline of labor to either either take over for ownership or even provide the closing, the type of services they need. And so paralegal services is a, ab paralegal is an absolute perfect transition or fit for that type of profession, that type of field. So what this requires then, so we've got people coming out of our prison system, yes, out do. of our jails. Yes, we do. How are we going to go about finding them? Because uh, you set a pipeline, which means mm -hmm. that you have to find them. Yes. You have to fund them. Yes, you do. You have to educate them. Yes, you do. Then you have to place them. Yes, you do. So, so, so how's that going? <laughs> yeah, it is a it is a true process, and, and, and that's how it's going. We were able to launch our first pilot class this summer, and it was amazing. It was an awesome experience. So we launched it at the Fairfax County Adult Detention Center, and we give an amazing, amazing thanks to Sheriff Stacy Kincaid for first taking taking a chance in launching this program, um, and she's been a big supporter from the very beginning. And so we launched it at the Adult Detention Center. We went forward with a class of about 10, um, excuse me, about eight, I think. Of the eight, four finished, and the four, other four, um, one was released early, and a few other had some other issues, so they weren't able to complete it. 
The four that remained, we've been able to replace three of them. Um, another one had to go on to do um, another, deal with another issue. But of those three, we now have them placed in internships. So the first six weeks, excuse me, the first part of the program, we spent six weeks in class on site teaching legal writing and research. We give them college level curriculum. We teach uh, legal writing, we teach legal research first, and we teach them how to find an answer. We tell them you're looking for a legal answer in a haystack, and we show them how to find that needle in the haystack. That second part, the second three weeks, we teach them legal writing, and we teach them everything from briefing a case to drafting court pleadings, memos. These are all things you will have to do as a paralegal. It is not difficult, it requires concentration and focus, but it is not rocket scientist, rocket science at all. The biggest thing is making sure you have the foundational skill set. Critical thinking, analytical thinking, um, legal writing is not just comprehending and reciting what you read, but also understanding and applying what you read to a client or a hypothetical situation. So it takes a lot of concentration and focus, but generally speaking, if you have a eighth grade education, most of everything you need to do at that point, you have the skill set to succeed. So let's talk about that. So you're doing it on site where the yes. prisoners already are. Yes. So this is not, you're actually giving them skills before they're mm -hmm. actually released. Correct. So that in of itself is amazing. It's not like get released, try to find housing, do all the things you need to do. It's like, no, while you're here, yes. we're going to teach you a skill. Yes. And so I'm sure that runs the gamut between yes. people who have a GED, people who have some college, and maybe people who have a four-year degree. Yes. And all of them are capable of being successful. Absolutely, absolutely. One of our strongest students was a GED, a GED from maybe 15 years ago. Uh, we also had a student who had a four-year degree. So the, 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 the education level in the class varied widely, um, but the success was consistent. And that was one of the things we expected uh, because we knew that the curriculum was doable. We know that there's a labor shortage, a very clear labor shortage for paralegals. There is a number, and it's one of the few career fields, career fields where it's only expected to grow. Right. So you don't have a, you're not looking down 10 years and expecting no jobs. What you're looking at is a projectile of a consistent growth in a field. And while that may change, it provides a entryway. And this program is not intended to provide the final, um, a complete, uh, education for the legal field, paralegal field, is intended to be an entryway, a gateway to a profession that will provide stability. And so that's why you're looking at internships. When, so in other words, you're not saying we're going to place a paralegal in your firm. You're saying we're going to get somebody ready for an internship in your firm, so Correct. which is kind of taking a prospective employee for a test drive. Absolutely. So when they go into what, whatever kind of organization, I'm assuming they're going to learn that kind of paralegal work because as we said, mm -hmm. it could be any kind of law firm or e not even a law firm, some organization that has in-house counsel or does a lot of documents like real estate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our intern, our, right now we have uh, triple the employers than we have the interns. Um, and that's a real problem because we have employers looking for for us to place interns and we don't have them in the pipeline right now. Most of our um, employers, uh, it, it really varies. We have employers that um, uh, range from big, um, excuse me, from a small solo immigration law firm. Uh, right now we have a, uh, a student from the program that's placed at the ACLU uh, in the DC office. We have another student that's placed at the law office of Chad Peterson, who's also a state senator. And uh, we were hoping our biggest, uh, recently, Senator Kane's office wanted to take an intern from our program. Because we, have our, we had already placed the first two that were released in uh, internships, the third was going to be placed as a work release opportunity. It was going to be, unexpectedly, a paid 40-hour work release internship. Wow. That fell through. And that fell through. And so talk about some of the hurdles. First of all, just let me go down a bunny trail about paid internships and the importance of paid internships and internships should be paid. I just happen to believe that there's even an organization called Pay Your Interns. So I believe oh, wow. in that. So the yeah. fact that, that Senator Kane was willing to pay yes. for an intern to be in his office is yes. amazing. Yes. But it wasn't as easy as it sounds, was it? It's not. It was not. Senator Kane's office uh, is, is so incredibly flexible. 
and so incredibly supportive. They asked, how can we make this happen? Unfortunately, because of work release, and this individual was at the Fairfax County Jail, they cannot leave the state law, the state jurisdiction. So they can't go outside Virginia. They cannot go to D.C. for Capitol Hill. That will take them outside the jurisdiction. When they go to his Manassas office, because he's on work release and the GPS is outside of the range of miles for a work release location. So he is not able to work within Cinder Kane's local Northern Virginia office as well. Right. So right now, our program has a paid internship. Although nominal, it is a paid 40-hour work week internship with Cinder Kane's office, and we have no one to place. Right. We have no one to place. And so these are some of the things that people don't think about. You know, I would yes. never have thought, like, well, you've got an opening, you've got somebody qualified, look, yes. we'll put them together. But yes. no, there's all of these things that you have to consider because it's a work release and he's yes. not yet served his time. Correct. You know, and I think that's one of the things, too, when we, we think about what we expect out of incarceration. Mm -hmm. Clearly, people are being punished. Yes. Are we rehabilitating them? Question mark. I think it determines what is, what is our goal. Is right. it to, to simply pay our dues to society? or is it to continually punish for a lifetime? And our, we live in a society, a country where our incarceration is at such a disproportionate rate to any other country in the world that our pipeline, our school is now a pipeline for the prison. Our foster care system is now a pipeline for the prison. That, and it's not just a privatization of prison. It is a clear pipeline. Um, if you are born in a certain place at a certain race or of a certain income, your chances of being put in that pipeline from school or foster care to prison is exponentially, just at the time of birth, increase. And that is a very serious and real issue for our country to accept and consider because that is a, a starting point for part of the problem of this system we consider to be broken. When you look at how do we change it, Education is, a, is obviously a, is a game changer. How do we get to that point? Do we offer these programs in, in on-site? Part of the issue is that education became defunded. It did, and there's a huge gap too in between the types of education you get depending on where you live. So even yes. in our public education system, issues of poverty and disparity Absolutely. affects who ends up in that pipeline and who doesn't end up in that Absolutely. pipeline. Absolutely. So when we come back from our break, we're going to talk further with Kelly Hebron about how we look at putting people in prison into the paralegal profession. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's that? Do we have a gun? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it cross-referencing travel sites, and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers, I got us bumped. They were like, oh, but now they're like... <laughs> Aloha, you aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting? Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. 
You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. Kelly Hebron is joining me today, and we are talking about the program from prison to paralegal. Thank you so much for being here to talk about this. I think, it's a, I think it's a wonderful program. Thank and when you. we went to break, we were talking a little bit about the disparity in, in education. And mm -hmm. to, a, to a certain extent, that actually feeds who ends mm -hmm. up in prison. Mm -hmm. Issues of poverty, Absolutely. your zip code you know, mm -hmm. the, your family structure. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about women in prison because the Absolutely. ACLU, just this past, mm -hmm. this last week, they have started a program that focuses on women in prison. That's mm -hmm. a hashtag, by the way, hashtag women in prison from the Virginia ACLU. Mm -hmm. There has been an explosion in the percentage of women in prison, something like 300% yeah, in the last three years. So talk a little bit about who ends up there and how, what we should do when you consider that oh, eighty absolutely. eighty percent of the of the of the women in prison are mothers, eighty percent mothers are having babies while they're in prison. We are able to provide childcare. We are able to help them with delivery, but then that's where we leave them, and we don't necessarily do anything further. And so it really should come, shouldn't come as any surprise that once they're released, they return. And one of the things again, I. You asked me um, um, at the beginning what made me, what motivated me, how did I get to this this point. I know that I've been very fortunate. Um, I was raised for the most part in the Philadelphia public schools, and I got a pretty decent education. But I also know that it could have very easily turned out so differently. And you start to realize and recognize how fortunate and how luck of the draw right. some of this ends up. There but for the grace of God go any of us. You will end up at go. Yeah. without a chance, depending on where you are born. And so when you keep those things in perspective, the um, babies born in jail, when their mothers are in jail, do not have any further a better chance at birth than their mothers do at the time they're birth, giving birth to the, these, these babies. So keeping that in perspective, one of the things we also look at, what are the options in education? And beyond the GED, there aren't any. But we have these real labor shortages. And we have this real set of skill set that's, easy, that's relatively easy and adaptable and transferable. You can teach it. You can transfer to a normal, number of types of jobs. Um, like you said, an executive assistant. You know, having that absolutely. background and that skills training makes you qualified for lots of absolutely. other things. Absolutely. But there are, a lot of, there are not a lot of programs for women. There just are not a lot of programs out there for women. They provide women with things such as childcare in prison. They provide women with things such as um, uh, prenatal care. They will provide them with the basics of what we would consider typical gender necessary things. But they don't provide many. There are a lot of welding. There are a lot of trade training programs. And technical training. Technical training. And a lot of men participate. And it's geared towards men. And they have to keep them also separate um, in right. separate facilities, and, right. et cetera. And so that's also a limitation, a barrier um, as well. Um, and sometimes it comes down to numbers. You know, Catherine, they may have 15 men sign up and two women sign up. Right, and that's just your number base to start, that's just your population to start with. And so if they don't have enough women, there's a barrier for right. entry. And so uh, there's a number of, uh, and again, we could talk uh, I know. Uh, about that issue for right? hours, but women are one of the biggest demographics in prison, although they are rising in numbers in demographics in our prisons, that are most neglected in terms of providing a recidivism program. The, the focus here is that, and we debated this sometimes, do we call it a recidivism reduction program or are we gonna focus and call this a workforce development training it's both. program? And it is both, it's essentially both. And that's what really needs to happen in our jails and in our prisons. We need workforce development to meet the needs of our labor shortage. We need the, um, the programs to reduce recidivism because it is well documented that with the right education, the right amount of livable wage, that's what's needed to, to keep reduce, people, yeah. to, re to reduce the recidivism. If you are coming out and you have absolutely nothing, nowhere to go, you have no license, you have no voting rights, you don't, you're worrying about homelessness. Right, you have no place to live. The, there is no reasonable expectation 
that you're going to do something other than the thing you were doing before you got into jail? There is nothing. There is absolutely no reasonable expectation that anything's going to change. So if you keep doing the same things you're doing, you're going to get the same, same result. result. And I think that if you focus on education, you focus on training, not necessarily providing degrees or endless certification, but if you start as an entryway, here's a start to this skill set. Start with legal research, start with legal writing. It does two things. Not only does it give a skill set, it gives hope. And do you know why it gives hope? Because they now have confidence. They now right. have belief. When I know that first day, I walked in, I was scared, we were all nervous, no one knew how this was going to go. I'm sitting there in this classroom, and my instructor's there, and we have eight students looking at us, looking to us for answers. And this is our very first program. And I remember thinking, okay, this has to work. And I remember I asked the question, do you guys know what's going on? Like, wh why are you here? You know, and we heard a few mumbles like, yeah, we heard there's a legal class, we'll, we'll sign up, we figured we'll try it. They had no idea that it was a full program that was going to lead potentially to a new job, a new career. And I'll never forget, one of the guys said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this was such an opportunity. He almost was in tears. And I remember he, and he said, I'm going to go buy a suit. I'm going to go buy a suit because he felt like he had hope. He felt like he had confidence. And when we finished that program and when we had that graduation that last day, I remember at least two of them coming over and saying, I've never finished anything before in my life. And this is the first time I put it forth, I knew I was going to finish it. And so it brings more than just a skill set. It's a change in their self-esteem. It's a change in confidence because you're now saying, hey, I can do legal work. I'm not just, right. I'm not like just I can answering a thing. phone. Right. I, I can, can do, do legal thing. work. Yeah. I understand what it means to ca brief a case. I understand a legal concept, and I'm smarter than I ever thought I, could, I was. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's as important as giving. Um, it's, if you teach a man to fish. Right. You feed him for a lifetime as opposed to yeah. handing somebody. Absolutely. And, you know, and, th and I think you're right, too, about the fact that two things you're you're giving them the training where they already are Absolutely. this is not waiting for them to get out you know both of us know um, friends of guest house wonderful reentry program Absolutely. but they can only handle 26 women at a time so right. but their recidivism rate is very low it because is. of how they but they too are looking for workforce development opportunities they Absolutely. too are looking for that that pathway the pathway yes. to a living wage yes. and a job that has potential and so it seems to me that we're at the very nascent aspect of trying to figure out what to do with all these people yes. who are currently incarcerated. And you've got one, one small program. Absolutely. So explain how this is a social entrepreneurship program. Oh, absolutely. So what it is, it's basically, it's a for-profit venture geared towards social good. It's, a, it's called a social enterprise. Um, some of the things that the plans are, the plans that are in place are to have this as a, we're not limited as a nonprofit. We're not limited to one mission. We are geared towards social enterprise where we can provide a foundation, um, not just for a skill set, but also create a foundation where we can provide whether it's scholarship um, or we can provide uh, training or we can even provide other, um, other career support needed for a new career. So this is a program under Rising Tide Inc. Inc. Yes. So Rising Tide Inc. is the social enterprise. Yes. And this is a program underneath that. So Correct. there could be other programs. Oh, but this is but this is your this is your area of expertise, which yes. is why you started here. Like I know how to teach this. Yes. And I know how to find internships and I know yes. how to find instructors. Yes. So but there could be other kinds of training in Absolutely. in the jails and prisons, but Absolutely. you're basically piloting this one. I am. I am. We are. We, uh, we're piloting this program at the prison where we are going to pilot it for all three phases. We did the six weeks on site in the classroom. We are now at the internship phase. We are n now waiting for this third component, which are employers, to actually have paid jobs. Not a paid internship, but a paid job f waiting at the next stage. So the reason why this program was put together is that we have a lot of training programs that exist that provide instruction, that provides um, maybe um, instruction for a specific field. 
but you do, don't usually get a training program that has the instruction along with the on-site practical externship. Right. And that's what's critical because you want the employer to understand, you, yes, they've had this in training and we provide them with a copy of the work. So, for example, when the ACLU decided to take an intern, we had the portfolio of the student's work prepared in a binder and provide them with copies of, all, of the work from all six weeks. And so they were able to see the progress and the level of sophistication and the type of assignments. Once he begins work, they give them their assignments based on what's their comfort level, and it will vary from employer to employer. But the idea is that they're getting substantial, relevant, on-the-job training that will help them prove their worth because you can you have a lot of jobs that says we want a bachelor's degree and I'm not knocking a bachelor's I degree know, but it's a blanket thing but it's an issue of equity right. and it's not always well placed and so if you have a, a, a skill set I have talked to so many employers of paralegals whether it's the senior paralegal or the ch partner at a law firm they don't really care as much about the bachelor's degree as much as they care about can you do what I need you to do. The skill set, the basic core skill set. It is so set. critical and a lot of it's on the job training because it will vary from job to job. So the employer may say I want a bachelor's degree but really what they need is someone who can efficiently, quickly, clearly, concisely and accurately find a legal answer. Right. And if you can do that you're worth well more than a four-year degree because sometimes that four-year degree gets fired. That's true, and we, t we talked about how quickly things change. So you have to have a core skill set, but you might you be working for a law firm who takes on some new kind of law because some new industries popped Absolutely. up, and suddenly you can't just say, well, I have a degree from 10 years ago, because now you have to have the skills you necessary do. to adapt to the new thing. Absolutely, and technology is changing every day. And one of, my, one of the things our students were able to demonstrate was their adaptability and their flexibility. Because it was on site at the jail, internet access was not permissible for our students. So the traditional way of teaching legal research through internet-based um, uh, LexisNexis or Westlaw, we couldn't provide. We didn't have access necessary to a full law library. Instead, what uh, the jail was able to provide was the old-fashioned LexisNexis disk, which I did not know even still existed. Well, look at that. <laughs> and they actually loaded manually LexisNexis is the most updated version onto two computers and our students learn to do legal research off manual disk for LexisNexis. So this is what I truly call old school. Old school and <laughs> adaptability. And then that's what you want them to learn, critical thinking yeah. skills. Not necessarily the thing for today, but Absolutely. the thing that's for today, tomorrow, and the next day. Absolutely. And so one of the things that I want to talk to when, when we come back, we're actually mm -hmm. going to have one of the graduates from your program. Yes, yes. Right? So please join us after the break. We are actually going to have one of the graduates from this program, which is Prism to Paralegal, when we come back. So join us and find out more, too, about how you can help, whether it's finding internships, finding sponsorship money, or finding employers. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help. And slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. is an adventure full of special moments. A cruise! Right. Unexpected moments. I got this. And even awkward moments. Okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> but every moment you spend with your kids, <laughs> even the smallest moments, Aww. can make the biggest impact on your child's life. So take a moment to be a dad today. <laughs> So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys. 
and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. Tonight we are talking about the program From Prison to Paralegal with the founder, Kelly Hebron, and now joining us with Muhammad. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. So we had a call from Lauren and Falls Church asking specifically, how do you decide who gets in the program? Oh, that's a good question. What we did was basically create three fundamental skill sets that are needed. Uh, grammar, reading comprehension, and language arts, mostly. And I guess that's kind of grammar, but it's a little bit more it's like a reading. Another one's like editing. Mm -hmm. And then we just had a, um, uh, a writing, uh, a short writing sample. And basically, we just kind of make sure they're at an eighth grade uh, operational level. Right. And it doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be at least at a functional level. And so long as you're able to comprehend what you're reading. If you're reading a case brief, can you comprehend what you're reading? And then we'll teach you how to do the application of the law, the analysis portion. So the accessibility, the assessment is multiple choice, true or false, and a short writing example, writing sample. So you get people who are interested, mm -hmm. you give them the assessment, yes. and based on the assessment, you select the people in the program. The jail did a, the jail provided the, um, I gave them the assessment, and at the jail, they hosted the um, testing. Okay, so Mohammed, this is where you get to tell us how you became interested in this program and sort of what motivated you to say, maybe I want to give this a try. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as a young adult, I made a few mistakes in my past and, you know, being in jail, there's not a lot of hope, you know, there's not a lot of programs actually in, in this area and whatnot. You don't see a lot of opportunities. I know some places they do opportunities, but not a lot over here. So I saw a sign that was, uh, posted in the alternative incarceration branch, which is like the pre-release center. And um, it was it offered the paralegal program. You know, it said, you know, you go through this amount of training and there's an internship offered at the end. And I don't, I think it costs money on the outside to get an opportunity like that. So I was stunned, I called my mom and I was like, you know, there's opportunity. She was like, you better take it right away. <laughs> That's the kind so, of things moms say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So she was very happy to hear about that because at least, you know, spending, you know, I spent a little bit of time in jail, but at least it wasn't a waste. It didn't go towards nothing else. So I was like, let me take this opportunity from the start. And as I looked into it more and more, um, you know, I was, became more and more interested. In, in so how did you find the assessment? Was that difficult or were you like, no, I got this? Uh, the assessment, no, it wasn't difficult. It was just, uh, um, you know, I was, it, it's pretty much just seeing if you can write, read, and, you know, pick out certain information. Because with par paralegal work, you, you find a lot of information. You got to find a lot of information. and read through a lot of stuff, you know, you know, summarize a lot of things. So it was just Was this kind basis. of similar to what you had in high school? Yeah, yes. Kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, kind of like that, yeah. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. So once you did the initial assessment, what did, you know, how did you find integrating the classes itself into your routine? I mean, did, was this ended up, I'm, 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 I'm hoping, like mm -hmm. any mother, you're going to say, it was the highlight of my day. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was, uh, yeah, the, the, that was the best part of the day, best part of the week, actually. Because, wow. you know, it, there's nothing, you, you don't really look, when you're doing, you know. You, know, you got a lot of time on your hands, You got right? a lot of time on your hands, yeah. And you, you want to do something positive. Because when you look back into five years, you know, maybe five years down the line, when I'm somewhere and I look back, I want to say, okay, yeah, I spent time doing something. Not just sitting there watching TV or, you know, a lot of people play cards. And they just, it's a waste of time. So I looked at it as like, you know, every day I look forward to it and make sure to get everything Make sure you get 100 percent on everything. You know, get, do all my work properly. So, and so, and so, where? So you got out. You're a graduate of the program. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how you move forward from that point. Uh, it was actually it helped me out a lot from that point because I wanted to get back into school. Uh, Professor Hebron, you know, gave a lot of pathways to you know get back into school. You know, why you're doing this internship. So I got back into school. Um, it really helped me out because it put me in a professional environment and. You know, I've never been in a professional environment like that, and it's a different feeling. You know, a lot of people that are in that world, you know, that don't have a lot of opportunities, they don't get to see that environment, and it changes you. You know, people are more respectful. You know, you enjoy going to work each day, and yeah, I really enjoy. Yeah, I really enjoy. You you bring up something really important, and this is 
do you take your child to work day? Because, you know, when President Obama was in office, he's mm -hmm. like, don't take your child to work today, take someone else's child to work today. Mm -hmm. Because what we know about the opportunities or what mm -hmm. our children know about the mm -hmm. opportunities available to them mm -hmm. is limited by what their parents do. If your dad works for a grocery store, then that's what you see. If your mm -hmm. dad is a cop, that's what you see. If mm -hmm. your dad is a lawyer, that's what you see. Mm -hmm. And so kind of your idea about what's available to you is Absolutely. based on what your parents do. Absolutely. So, Limited, yes. Yeah, so when you're like, I just never saw myself in this professional environment, and, yeah. and here I was, and I fit in, and I could do this, and it really mm -hmm. shows us yeah. how we need to do a better job. It gives you a lot of hope at the end of the day. Once you get into that environment, you're like, all right, why wasn't I working on this for the past couple of years, you know? Because like sometimes, this, because sometimes yeah. you can't be what you can't see. Exactly. And this is, you find this a lot with, with girls and things like yeah. STEM. It's like, yeah. how can you be something if you've never met anybody? Absolutely. If you've never met anybody Absolutely. who does that kind of work, how can you imagine yourself doing mm -hmm. that kind of work? But clearly, you feel very competent and capable where you are. Yeah. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. It's an internship at the ACLU, so it's, it's very, it's very, um, it's, you know, you work around a lot of professional people, so it's... And so, let me ask you this, you know, working for the ACLU, and I'm very familiar with what they do, how important is it to you to do work that is meaningful and valuable and makes you feel like you're doing something for sort of the greater good? In other words, you hear a lot about how millennials um, are not just looking for a paycheck. Millennials are looking for investing their time, their energy, their professionalism into something that, you know, makes it better for the rest of the world. And I, and I really think getting a job at the ACLU is probably, you landed in the perfect spot, right? <laughs> am, I, am I wrong there? No, I think that's no. a good summation. Yeah. 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 I mean, you go to work every day and you're like, I am making the world a better place. You have a purpose, basically. That's what it is. You, you, you don't just work for money. You work for, you know, you work towards something, which is nice. So that's actually, that's, that's the biggest thing about the whole thing, you know. Uh, Professor Yaron asked me about different internships. She had a lot of them lined up, but I think this one, I really, it really touched home. It was a good fit for you. Yes, absolutely. Because my parents are immigrants, so you know the whole situation going on right now. So it really touched home. Yeah. You know, and so do you see yourself? So now that you're where you are, do you see a world of other possibilities kind of rolled out in front of you as well? Absolutely, big world of opportunities coming from this. I see. You know, you look at jobs and everybody looks at price range, you know, what you make, but it's not about, it's not about what you make, it's about doing something that you like each day, you know, and you will make the money, that's there, but once you get, get that, you know, that groove on, you go to work, you know, you enjoy your work, then it's a whole different world, you know, you stay away from all the trouble, you're around good people, so. And yeah. you're investing too. You yeah. know, one of the things that, um, when I, I talk to young people about the benefit of lifelong learning is that the one thing people can never take away from you is what is in your mind. Like, you know, you, you, your car might depreciate in value. <laughs> there are a lot of things that you could spend money on that may not hold its value, but everything you learn and every skill you have can mm -hmm. never, never be taken away yes. from you. And that has to feel good to know that every day that you're at the ACL, ACLU and all the things that you are learning will just make you better, more accomplished, and give you more opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You know, he's great. Wow. Right. <laughs> so, so you got, you mentioned that you've got triple the amount of internships than you've actually got interns. I do. I do, I do. And that is a real, that's a good problem to have. That's a very good problem. We, we have seen an enormous amount of um, outpouring from the, the various employers in the legal community. They are so willing to support, but what we really need at this point are paid jobs. We need two things. We need paid jobs, but we also need more students. But it's almost what comes first. The chicken or the egg, right? It, it comes down to how do we get more programs, more classes launched. Um, this pilot um, class was amazing. Um, the students were, were, were beyond amazing. The support we received from the sheriff and her staff was beyond amazing. And now we are at a point where we have triple the employers who are now, there's a wait list for interns from this program. So we need to get another class launch. That's the first thing. We need another class launch. And we would love, and we're hoping to work with Friends of Guest House. Um, and we need to find funding to support launching that program. And then I think the second thing is also we need paid jobs. 
because while it is great that we have these internships, we want more than just a 90-day internship. We want a full-time job. We want a career, entryway to a career. And we recognize that that will depend on skill set. Right. Yeah, it will. At the end of the day. It will. And so and you've been motivated to go back to school. So at some point in the future, if you saw that an opportunity required more education, would that be something at this point in your life you would feel like you could invest in and it would have a return for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. From taking the class and getting to where I'm at right now, I definitely see the difference between, you know, putting in the effort and getting an education in anything and then, you know, seeing the reward in it. So, absolutely. You know, so, and so t again, the whole idea that this is an entryway program, this is not the end all and the be all. This not is a, the first step on a long mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. that has many branches to it. It does. Like, you know, it will be interesting in three and five and ten years to mm -hmm. go back and find out where Muhammad is and where, Absolutely. you know, the, your inaugural freshman class yes. of the people who went through this program Absolutely. actually ended up. Absolutely. So do you feel pretty confident, too, that you will not be seeing the inside of any sort of <laughs> incarceration? But from this point, you're feeling pretty confident about that, Mohammed? Yes, I don't want to jinx myself, but yes. yes See, and, yeah. you know, and I think that's the other thing, don't you, Kelly? Tell me I'm wrong, but it's Absolutely. kind of like it's not just making you feel like you can go forth and have Absolutely. a career and support yourself and have a, a successful, Absolutely. fulfilling life, but it's the fact that you're not seeing yourself being back it where... It is, yeah. it is, and that's the starting point. I mean, we're going to be realistic, um, but the idea is that the starting point has to be first, where do you see yourself after a result of this program? And the idea is that we hope we see, you see yourself gainfully employed in the profession that works for you. Right. But it's, it is to open up hope, dreams, and to just stretch what you think of where you can end up. Absolutely. So after your 90-day internship is over, right, now you're going to be looking for regular employment. Yes. So, it, you know, would you like to just talk to any prospective employers out there and say, <laughs> in 90 days, I will be available? No, you don't have to do that. I'm doing that for you. But Muhammad's going to be available, and he's actually very Absolutely. skilled, and he's got things going for him, so keep that in mind. But I think mm -hmm. that we have to remember, just because we have removed the box, there was a whole ban the mm -hmm. box movement mm -hmm. to remove that, yes. that question from yes. employment applications. The fact of the matter is, we all know in the real world they do background checks. Yes. So they can, you can apply and you can be say, oh, we'd like to make you an offer. But the minute they do the background check, people have to be willing to say, whoa, Muhammad, can you kind of explain this thing? For you to be able to say, mm -hmm. yes, I can explain it. And this is where I am now. And this mm -hmm. is where I came from and through this program. So I think we have to be very real world in helping our viewers understand that it's more than just the program. It's more than the education. Employers have to be willing to say, I'm, I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> well, okay, so this is our cue. I want to thank you, Muhammad, for being here thank because you, so you are the living embodiment of yes. exactly what Kelly has been trying to do. And it's nice to meet a graduate of a program who's landed in an internship he loves. Yes. And you should be very proud. Yes. Join, <laughs> join us after this break when we are going to talk further with Kelly Hebron of the Prison to Paralegal program. So I just moved in with his family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, I'll poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. <sighs> so how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, mm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Wow. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. <laughs> 150 over 90. 
180 over 111. 160 over 110, I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. I am talking with Kelly Hebron, who is the founder of the program From Prison to Paralegal. This has been fascinating, Kelly. It really has. Yeah, I'm glad. And so I want to talk about, now that we've, we've sort of met Muhammad, who is yes. an amazing graduate of your program. Yes. This is a tiny pilot program, mm -hmm. but clearly you've got a lot of people who need this. There's a lot of jails and prisons. Right Absolutely. now you're doing this at Fairfax County. Absolutely. So what do we need to do to support you? Oh, awesome. Thank you for asking me. Um, support is, gosh, where do we even start? Uh, first, we would love to launch more classes. And I can't tell you that, I can tell you that there's a wait list already for another class at the detention center. There was a wait list forming this summer for this detention center. So the way the class was formed, of the one at the detention center, it was one woman that was able to take the class. It was all men otherwise. There was a huge wait list for women to take this class right now, as well as men at the detention center. So but do you need instructors? I need instructors. I need funding to launch the next class. But also, we need jobs. Because it, like any program, if you're going to establish its validity in terms of reduction of recidivism, we need permanent full-time jobs. This is a, 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 a end game, a, a, the end game goal for this program. And yes, it is a pilot. So we need employers to step forward and provide an MOU or something right. that says, if you finish this class, if you finish a 90-day internship, whether it's with us or someone else, we will give you a, a job, we will hire you. And the more, the merrier. If I can have just as many um, employer's commitment as I do for internships, that would be wonderful. And that's the f one of the first things. So we need two things. We need more classes so we can p have a pipeline um, to put into these internships and, and eventually into jobs. We also need jobs waiting for them. And they're there. They're out there. Um, we are, um, if you do a Google search for any day, if you go to in, any, any job board and you put in paralegal jobs just for Fairfax County, you will see a number, you will see page after page of jobs that come up. And there will be different requirements. But the first thing is we need to launch the, another class, and we also need commitments from employers. And that's pretty, pretty critical because the success of this program is based on job placement. And it doesn't always have to be in a legal field. It can be executive assistant. It can also serve things such as court clerks and things where are non-traditional. But so long as they have jobs afterwards where they are using their skill set, which is transferable, um, which is so a foundation for 10 years down the road, then we've achieved our mission. So, so in order for you to have a class for the men and the mm -hmm. women at the adult detention yes. center, you need funding for those instructors, I'm assuming. Correct. That, that is the very first thing. Instructors, money yes. to pay the instructors and more instructors. And money for textbooks. And money for textbooks. So, this, so we're getting a wish list now. Yes, we are. So if, if there were organizations that make grants, and they might be small collective giving mm -hmm. Absolutely. organizations. Absolutely. It might be uh, faith communities who provide grants. There's Absolutely. lots of people who give grants to small local nonprofits. Yes. Right? And so yes. what this is doing is basically paying for instructors and, and textbooks so that you can expand the program. Yes. You've got people who've committed to internships. and You've got more of those than you've got students right now, right? Yes. But let's use the ACLU as an, as an example. They've committed to a 90-day internship. So yes, once yeah. Muhammad is done there, mm -hmm. you want him to go to a full-paid 40-hour week job. Yes. Which means that there's another intern that can be slotted in yes. to the ACLU. Yes. So the ACLU, every 90 days, could end up with somebody Absolutely. else working for them from your Absolutely. program. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. We've just got to have a place to take the, the completed interns and move them into full-time paying jobs. And they receive evaluations. So just like any other job, they're leaving. Um, so when Muhammad leaves the ACLU, he's going to have a complete reference, a reference letter from his work that he's did in a classroom and a reference of his work done at the ACLU. And that, that those two we're hoping should be a starting point for our entryway into this field because he's not coming in with hopes and a dream and no experience. He's coming in with some very well grounded foundational work as well as some very 
on the job practical experience. And that's what's really critical. The thing is, paralegal work is not just academic. It really is the practice of law. And so you have to come in being able to be flexible, adaptable, and trainable. And that's what we emphasize our program. And there's another benefit, by the way, to these employers. There's something called the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. Yes, and we didn't even talk about that. Thank you for remembering to bring that up. Absolutely. The Work Opportunity Tax Credit is what is the big piece, missing piece, of the connectedness. Because the employer can say to, I'm carrying a lot of risk of just taking on, on um, 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 this individual. Well, they get the benefit because they get a tax credit. And then in some jurisdiction, I'm not the expert here, but as I understand it, there's actually bonding available to employers who hire uh, a formerly high risk incarcerated, incarcerated individuals. Person. Yeah. And that provides a bonding. So between the tax credit and the bonding, and then there are, in some jurisdictions, there are even state tax credits available or local city tax credit. And so while you say this is scalable, absolutely. Um, some jurisdictions have tax credit programs in place where the only thing they need is a program to provide them with the, the individuals. So after you're, you know, you've, so you've got a pilot program, mm -hmm. your first small one. Yes. And now you've got people waiting, waiting, waiting in line. Absolutely. To be your next class. Yes. And so you need partnerships, you need grants, and you need money. Mm -hmm. But then outside of the Fairfax Adult Detention Center, where do you go? I mean, there's Loudoun, Absolutely. there's, you know, there's Alexandria, and that's, those are just jails. I mean, yes. there's lots of regional jails, and then there are prisons. And there's Department of Corrections. Absolutely. This is a program that is scalable, that is implement, it can be implemented in a variety of formats. Um, one of the things that's come from being a, a full-time paralegal professor has been the, the ability to adapt to a number of delivery formats. So we can deliver it online, we can deliver it on site, we can deliver it as a hybrid. W the delivery method is not a challenge for us, it's actually getting it implemented. And right. so it doesn't matter whether it's a federal prison or it's a small local jail, we can, we can accommodate the scenario, it's getting it launched in, in these, these locations that, that we're working on. So you're basically looking then for partners as well. Absolutely. You know, so there, there are people, you know, the, the one thing to make a program work is sustain, a sustainable source of funding. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you said, yes. Stacy Kincaid believed in the program, and so yes. she was willing to say, come in and give it a try. But in order to scale it, to do more, it's not that the, the money can all come from the jails mm -hmm. or the Department of Corrections. They're Correct. not necessarily going to fund that. So you've got to find partners who are like, this is something worthwhile mm -hmm. and it's worth a commitment of sustainable Correct. money. Yes, you got it. It's, it has to be a, a, uh, a partnership where we can uh, grow the program and have a joint mission where the idea is that we can get it launched we can get the interns in place. And there are a lot of things, a lot of challenges. Um, for instance, some of these interns um, need assistance with placement, of, not just placement, but being able to, for transportation. Right, transportation is a huge issue. And so, you know, Muhammad, you know, he's fortunate he was able to make arrangements so he can go downtown to D.C. Uh, for his internship. The second intern we placed at, um, is nearby, is in walking distance to her internship. That's amazing. So sh that particular, she is able to walk to her job. So she doesn't need a car. She does not she need a car. She doesn't have to take three buses she and spend not. three hours getting there, which she is a problem not. with bus transportation. She does often. not. But I have to tell you, with the third one, we were working out the scenarios for that work release. It was amazing the amount of effort everyone was putting in to make it happen. Um, and so it is a lot of work to make the logistics as well. So it's not just launching the class, paying for the instructors, paying for the textbook, the support, the subscription services, and everything else that goes into it. But also we have to be cognizant that at times there will be challenges for transportation um, to get them to and from uh, the internships. And then I think also what some of the things we, that was a, a takeaway and learning from the pilot is clothes. Oh my goodness, right? You know, one of the things as it was, we were down to the wire, we're ready to launch, and one of the interns, wait, I need to get clothes. I don't have any clothes to wear to an office. And so those are very real issues that we have to be aware of and remember to keep in, in place, keep in mind as we, as we work through the scalability and implementation. Of You're absolutely class. right. And that brings to mind the um, women giving back. Yes. Program in Sterling has a lot of partnerships and they do provide clothing. And I think mm -hmm. they provide men's clothing too. We'll have to talk after the show. But as you collaborate, this is really important too. Who, what are some of the other organizations besides like Friends of Guesthouse 
that might be good collaborators for you. Absolutely. I've been in touch with Oxford House. Oxford House is a huge organization. Oxford House has, has a wonderful, wonderful resource in terms of the, their recidivism rate, I think, is at a high of 85, 87 percent. Wow, that's impressive. I, I think, and I'm, I don't want to misquote, but it's an extremely high recidivism rate. And that would be an excellent partner um, for women um, who are interested, and not just women, actually women and men who are interested in a different type of field. Another thing that's also um, to keep in mind is that a lot of individuals may have had a work experience in another career prior to entering the system, but now they're older. They don't want to go back to working with their hands or working out in the heat or doing the hard labor they were doing in their 20s, now they're in their 40s or 50s. And that's another thing. It's not just for the young. It's, also, it's also adaptable for a variety so of that's a career transition, and you're absolutely, absolutely right. Absolutely, absolutely. And so keeping all of that in mind, I think partnerships are just, and I'll tell you also, also makes good veterans. Ah. Incarcerated veterans are also excellent. They bring forth a whole new set of, um, of, uh, of skill set that add on top of the paralegal. And another skill set that people overlook that's good match is that a paralegal training match with project management right. makes for an incredibly valuable employee. And so it's a lot of different ways, as you said, I think you said a lot of branches to this tree. Yeah, there how, are a lot of branches to how, this tree. Of the opportunities. It works as a diversion program in this, as, um, for the, the juvenile justice system or in, in the schools. For a number of years, I represented juveniles in Baltimore City, and that was an experience in and of itself. But one of the things that's missing, that's a common denominator in all these scenarios, is that the training program does not provide on-the-job training program. And when you do more than just provide classroom training, when you provide not just a classroom training, but an actual work experience so that it comes to life, so that the employer can actually see, well, hey, this may work. This is a different way of looking at this viewpoint. And that, hey, I, this may be paid for by the tax credit. Oh, wait, this may also be covered by bonding, something I wouldn't get otherwise. It takes on a whole new dimension. And so the thing that's also that's usually missing is that job piece. And that's what's critical to success of this, this entire program because the mission is to reduce recidivism by job training. And the only way you get job training is providing jobs. And that's our goal. You know something, you're absolutely right too because it's soft skills that employers talk about. And mm -hmm. this is true for college graduates too. It's like, do they know how to work on a team? Yes. Do they know how to talk to their boss? Yes. Do they have emotional intelligence? Do they have empathy? Yes. You know, do they understand customer service not just outside, but inside in the place where they work? And you're absolutely right. You don't get that unless you act absolutely are in an office or absolutely. on the job. Absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you. I am very pumped up about this. I am a believer that this program is something that has been needed for such a long time. And you are a very visionary woman to have said, <laughs> not only do I see it, but I'm actually going to make it happen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that our viewers uh, feel sufficiently inspired and motivated to figure out how they can help you. So thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me and having us for, for having us as well. Thank you.